today's call, we will start with covering the topics you see here. An update on SBP's response to Winter Storm Uri, along with some insight into our rebuilding programs with a focus on Southwest Louisiana and the Bahamas. Next, we will update you on our opportunity housing program and our government advisory and advocacy work. Additionally, we will share some highlights from our vaccine deployments in Florida and Kentucky. Finally, for the last few minutes, we will answer your questions. Now, I would like to introduce SBP's Chief Development Officer, Elizabeth Egley. Hey, everybody, and thanks so much, Lily, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Without a doubt, the impact we share with you today would not be possible without the support of SB people like you on the call today. You are all so much a part of the impact, and I hope you are proud of how your support is helping thousands of people. So let's get it started. A big story of Q1 was Winter Storm Yuri. For about a week in February, people across the Southeast experienced unprecedented and unexpected hardships from freezing temperatures, snow, and ice. Power outages led to very cold living conditions, and most people had nowhere to find warmth. The cold temperatures led to frozen pipes, which inevitably busted, causing a deluge of water inside people's homes. Now, this event caused a lot of disruption and damages across the state, but for many low income struggling families, this was yet another blow to an already complicated situation. For the families SBP serves, Yuri added to the stresses caused by COVID, economic instability, lost jobs, and not to mention the hurricanes they are still recovering from. You can see from the stats on this slide, this was a major event. The cost and damages in Texas alone exceeded those caused by hurricanes Harvey and Ike combined. Even though the damage is not as visually apparent now and warmer weather has graced us across the south, it is still impacting countless families across Texas, Oklahoma, and southwest Louisiana. Um, to this day, many of folks still do not have running water. SVP's team is actively supporting families across Texas and Louisiana, and we'll share a bit more about that in the next slide. But before we jump to that, let's meet someone who was impacted by Yuri. Um, Miss Nellie, who you can see here in the bottom right hand corner of this slide, is a 77 year old grandmother in Houston. She's a retired school bus driver with a passion for mentoring children, and she's so sweet. Her dream is to launch a second career after COVID um, as a Walmart greeter. <laughs> um, we first met Miss Nellie after her, uh, Hurricane Harvey's floodwaters caused damages that displaced her from her beloved home. Um, some of our friends from Farmers Insurance on this call may remember working on her home. Uh, thanks to those volunteers and many others and the support of donors and our amazing AmeriCorps members, Miss Nellie was able to return back home, which has been her safe haven as an at-risk senior during the pandemic. But unfortunately, um, she was one of the millions of Texans to suffer unforeseen hardships and damage from the recent winter storm. Her pipes froze, causing severe plumbing and structural damage. And as a senior on a fixed income, she did not have the savings to hire a plumber and fix damages caused by the flooding. Thanks to the ground well, groundswell of support from all of you, we had the resources we needed to reach out to all past clients and new ones and deploy plumbing and repair teams. Our team provided Miss Nelly some meals and bottled water quickly assessed her damages and sent a crew to make plumbing repairs within days. For someone who has been through so much in recent years, we were so grateful to help her through this time and keep her from reaching her breaking point. Let's take a look at the impact on the next slide. Thanks. Um, as you know, SVP has active rebuilding sites in Houston, Texas and Southwest Louisiana. And both of these communities were impacted by URI. We also have nonprofit partners who are helping to geographically expand impact beyond these communities. And I'll share more about the work of our nonprofit partner network in the next slide. But here you can see some of our goals and progress towards them. 
we are two thirds of the way through our eight week rapid repair plan, which includes getting water flowing through plumbing repairs and fixing the home damages caused by the busted pipes. We are also, um, we also worked with our partners at Amazon and Lowe's to procure plumbing supplies, which were very hard to come by locally. Um, we got them from out of state and our plan was simple. Use these supplies and retain an army of plumbers and position them to do their best and highest use of and time is just plumbing. So our clients benefited from vetted contractors and the plumbers benefited from um, a nonstop work. That's working. The team is right on track to meet our goals. We continue to accept referrals and understand the ongoing need. Meanwhile, we have begun to follow up with drywall repairs to complete recoveries. None of this would have been possible without the generous support of the donors listed here. So thank you. Also, we were honored to be featured in the We're Texas fundraising concert, which was hosted by Matthew McConaughey and sponsored by some of our friends at NRG, AT&T, and American Airlines. In case you missed it, we will send a link to the event after this call. But I just love how they feature the story of Miss Laurie, whose picture you can see here. She's a lifetime Texan who serves as an SBP AmeriCorps member. Laurie's home was affected by the storm. She had lost power and had plumbing damages. But rather than worry about her own needs, she chose to focus on her commitment of service and was on site immediately, helping clients like Mr. Leonard, a Vietnam veteran, to muck out his home after busted pipes caused water damage in his walls. As Laurie states in the video, and I hope you guys watch it, we are here to get her done. Next slide. Thank you. All right, so I wanna take a minute to tell you about our SHARE intervention. One of SVP's core values is the mom rule, which means that we go about our work as if a loved one was impacted. If, if it was our own family, we wouldn't care what nonprofit was helping. All that matters is that the work is done quickly and in a high quality way. Through SVP's SHARE intervention, SVP seeks out nonprofit partners to expand our collective impact across a wider geography. Since URI affected more geographies than the two where we currently have operations, we wanted to make sure that families in rural and under-resourced areas were served too. The three things we share with partners are funding, training, and AmeriCorps members. I'll tell you a quick story. When my colleague Marley, who leads our work of the SHARE program, when she reached out to um, partners in East Texas to hear about what their client needs were, one of the nonprofits here that they actually didn't know their clients needs because they wanted to make sure that if they reached out to them that they'd have funding to help them so after marley shared that we can fund their work within three days that nonprofit partner had a list of 70 families with plumbing repair needs this quick partnership meant that miss molly an 85 year old from east texas who had spent two weeks in her home without running water imagine that and who otherwise might have waited much longer um, was helped by our partner organization working in that area. It's important to note that it is still essential to raise funds for SBPs on the ground work in the communities we served, but we do have a separate fund for share grants. We like to say that a dollar invested in SBPs share fund carries a value of $1.50 because it comes with additional training and support from our teams on the ground practitioners, which means the nonprofits we partner with are given sustainable tools that will benefit them beyond the current disaster response. Uh, now I'll kick it over to Thomas Corley, who's our continuous improvement officer for the impact of rebuilding work across the country. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, nice to be with you all uh, today. So I wanna take just a few minutes here to talk through SVP's overall rebuild impact, and then we'll zoom into two SVP operating sites, um, Southwest Louisiana and our Bahamas operation. So let me start by just saying I'm proud, and I hope all of you that are joining us today, you also feel that sense of pride. Um, thanks to the hard work of our, um, our team and our AmeriCorps members, SVP has built the most homes in quarter one 
than we've done in any quarter one of SVP's history. And really, I think this is a sign of things to come this year. So I hope that y'all will stay tuned for um, more awesome impact updates throughout the year. Um, we are at 178 families returned home uh, with 87 projects that are actively under construction today. And we're pushing towards our 2021 goal of rebuilding 639 homes. And this again will be the most number of homes that SVP has rebuilt in any year um, since our birth. Um, so super, super exciting. Um, but more than these homes uh, being rebuilt and more than just the material impact that we're having, these are families that are served. And these are families that have been creeping closer and closer to reaching that breaking point. And you heard Elizabeth talk about it um, with Yuri uh, just a moment ago. But these are families that are getting closer to their breaking point, which SVP is helping them avoid. Over the next quarter, we're going to serve more families and you'll you'll see those updates. But in quarter two, we're also excited um, to be able to celebrate the completion of SVP Superstorm Sandy recovery programs in both New York and New Jersey. We've been running uh, our program in New York and New Jersey for the better part of eight years. And by the time we end those programs, we will have served close to 700 families. So um, we're really proud of our work there and so thankful for the volunteers um, the staff, the AmeriCorps members that helped make that possible. So as we're completing our program in the Northeast, I'd like to just pivot here over to our newest operating site, which is in Southwest Louisiana. So let me just kind of do a lay of the land. Um, after hurricanes, Laura and Delta kind of leveled us with a one, two punch and impacted that community. Um, we recognized a number of things. Number one, there was very limited national attention and resources coming in to storm impacted uh, communities in southwest Louisiana. Um, there was widespread damage, hundreds of squares miles uh, that were impacted by uh, these hurricanes. And largely southwest Louisiana is occupied by low income families uh, working blue collar jobs. Um, SBP today is one of only a very few rebuilding groups that are in that community. Um, and we've done the most work. You can see here, we've got 24 homes that we've completed, uh, 17 that are under construction, 18 that are slated to start in the coming weeks, and then 40 pending approval. And so while we're proud of the work that we've done, um, it's also sobering, recognizing that we're the group that's done more than many, but there's still so much left to do. Uh, today, we have the resources to impact at a minimum 62 families. And so we're, we're gonna hit that in quarter two. And then the question is, where do we go from there? Um, our urgency to serve Southwest Louisiana, it's absolutely informed by the lack of resources in the community, but it's amplified and dialed up uh, because of the people that we're meeting. And, and one of those individuals is Mr. Roy, and you can see his photo here. Um, and just to the side, you can see his home and the impact of a fallen oak tree through his roof and the damage that it did. Um, I'll tell you that Mr. Roy, he reminds me of my father. Maybe he reminds you of someone in your life. Um, he's an 86 year old gentleman. He's over, always in his coveralls because he's always ready to work. That's all he's ever done um, is worked hard for um, his livelihood and his living. He's a brilliant guy. Um, he, when we first met him, he shared that he builds these kind of uh, true to scale airplane simply by looking to the sky and kind of capturing what an airplane looks like. And he's entered this into contest uh, across Southwest Louisiana and Texas. Um, so he's an artist, he's a fisherman. His home is where he raised his children, um, his two children and, and where his late wife, um, who he was married to for 40 years, um, where she passed away in their bedroom um, just, just some years ago. Um, when we met Mr. Roy, he had applied for FEMA and he received a modest award of just over $14,000. And it was nowhere close to what he needed to be able to undo what Laura and Delta did. With the help of SVP and our team members and our appeal process, we were able to work Mr. Roy through the FEMA reapplication and appeal in order to secure him an additional $20,000, bringing his award up to $34,000. And you'll see just below Mr. Roy here, um, we have a cross section of SVP clients that we've worked with where their original awards were 47,000. And with SVP support and our counseling and our shepherding through the FEMA uh, appeal uh, process, 
we were able to raise that total award to $153,000. So adding $106,000 to uh, the uh, uh, these homeowners and and their their resources to rebuild. Um, Mr. Roy is one of 225,000 people who applied for FEMA, and not everyone is in the same position as Mr. Roy. Um, but what we know from Mr. Roy's story and seeing what we were able to accomplish by shepherding him through the appeal process is that communities need more than just SVPs rebuilding support to recover and communities need more in order to fortify themselves against future disasters. And uh, Reese here is going to speak in just a little bit on that concept. Um, SVP has and we will continue to prevent folks like Mr. Roy from reaching his breaking point. And really before we move on, I just want to take one more stop in the Bahamas and share a couple of exciting updates to just further expand on what we're doing to help reduce suffering and prevent people from reaching their breaking point. So uh, let me come back to the beginning here. And when SVP first arrived in the Bahamas after Dorian hit almost 20 months ago, we immediately began flying in water. The local infrastructure and especially that through the hospital network was badly, badly damaged. And without clean water, surgeries and procedures were halted. And this isn't even to mention the added strain that was put on hospital staff, because not only were they water insecure in their profession and their ability to provide these surgeries and critical procedures, but also at home, they had no confidence in their ability to get water to drink, to bathe, to clean. So through a partnership with the CDC Foundation and the Bahamas Public Housing, or excuse me, Hospital Authority, and our friends over at Water Mission, SVP identified five sites to fund, develop, and build water storage and treatment facilities, which ensures that hospitals and the community have access to clean water if and when another Dorian hits the island. Um, at Rand Memorial Hospital, which is the largest hospital in Grand Bahama, the system that SVP helped fund and develop is going to be able to produce 10 times what the hospital needs. So it will serve as a hub for the community if water infrastructure is damaged again. But beyond this impact, SVP is continuing to meet families that are struggling to recover and are at risk of hitting their breaking point. We've completed 73 projects so far in 2021. One of those is the Hepburn family. You can see their photo and a quote from Ms. Hepburn there and what SVP's impact really meant for her and her grandson who she takes care of. Um, our team of executive directors, managers, and AmeriCorps members are out there today, right now, preventing more suffering. And y'all who are joining us today, you're the enablers. Your care and your support for SVP positions us to do more for those who need it most. And so with that, I'm really excited to hand this over to Lauren Avioli, who is SVP's real estate development manager. Thanks, Thomas. As the real estate development manager here at SVP, I work on our opportunity housing program. The opportunity housing program creates affordable, energy efficient and resilient homes for low and moderate income renters and first time home buyers to help people build resilience before disaster strikes. So in February of this year, we celebrated the 1 year anniversary of the St. Peter apartments, which is our 1st multifamily development. This mixed income 50 unit apartment community is also Louisiana's 1st net zero energy residential building which means that the building can generate through solar panels as much energy as it consumes. So residents are benefiting from the net zero energy features of this building already with more than half paying less than $30 on their electric bills and nearly a fifth paying nothing at all. Despite the pandemic, we also continued to build community at the property in socially distant ways, um, including with the establishment of a community garden. Mr. Sherman, pictured here in the top left, is leading the spring planting at the community garden. Like many of our residents at the St. Peter, Mr. Sherman is a veteran who came to us from being homeless. Um, he's lived at the St. Peter since it opened, and now he works part-time at the convention center. Moving down the left side here, our St. Claude Gardens scattered site duplex development is revitalizing the Lower Ninth Ward by providing 60 affordable units to low-income renters. This development will put new resilient homes on 30 blighted lots in the Lower Ninth Ward, helping to bring residents back to this neighborhood, which really has not yet fully recovered from Hurricane Katrina. We've got 17 occupied units currently, with more units becoming move-in ready every day. 
all 60 uh, of the units will be complete by summer. And I want to note these homes are all Energy Star 3.0 and built to the fortified gold standard, meaning they'll provide both energy savings and hurricane resilience for the residents. In the top right corner, you can see a home that we recently sold in the lower ninth ward to a first time home buyer, Ms. Jasmine. She says owning a home in this area um, is doubly important to her because so many of her relatives were not able to come back after Katrina. This marks our third sale of the year and it enables Ms. Jasmine to become just the third person in her family to own their own home. We've got eight more homes slated to be sold in New Orleans this year. Uh, our program is focused on lower income first time home buyers. So uh, we're helping populations that have been historically underserved gain access to home ownership so that they can build wealth that can be passed down for generations. And then finally, we're really excited to expand our opportunity housing work to our second market, Houston, Texas. Like New Orleans, uh, Houston suffers from affordability and disaster vulnerability issues. Low income residents here face a lack of affordable safe homes outside floodplains. So we have four projects in pre-development. These include a 60 unit ultra energy efficient apartment community that kind of replicates our success at the St. Peter. Two smaller scale rental developments of seven units each shown in the rendering here, and then seven for sale homes for first time home buyers in neighborhoods across Houston. So look for more updates on these developments in future quarterly reports. And with that, I'll turn it over to Reese May, our chief strategy and innovation officer. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, and thank you all for joining. I'm excited to share more today about SBP's advice and advocate interventions, but first I want to make sure that I connect that to the why. So over the years, SBP's learned that our rebuilding clients um, often became such because they failed to access some of that complicated federal assistance that Thomas mentioned earlier, FEMA awards and SBA loans and et cetera, or uh, our clients were overlooked by a state or local government program that they should have qualified for, but perhaps were not well served by. And what we've learned at SBP is that when survivors access the resources they need, and when local government programs work effectively, fewer people need our rebuilding assistance. And so SBP's advice intervention is really about empowering state and local governments to lead more effective disaster preparedness and recovery programs. Around the country, more than 60% of federally funded recovery programs are performing behind schedule. That means billions of dollars with a B in taxpayer assistance is failing to help American communities that are still struggling to recover from natural disasters. SPP's advisory work is not as visible as our building work and our welcome home parties, but by improving the performance of these government programs and implementing billions of dollars in recovery funds, we create better outcomes for the millions of Americans that are affected by disasters each year. Around the country, we found that state and local leaders receive little training before being thrust into positions of disaster recovery leadership where the stakes are high and the learning curve is steep. Our team of experienced government leaders and advisors shape better recoveries by providing leaders with training, advice, and direct services. Thanks to the Walmart Foundation, SBP has been providing training through its leader practitioner course for nearly two years now. And though COVID-19 drove our content online, we've only seen demand for it increase, both in person and remotely. So far this year, we've trained 198 unique individuals from 21 different grantees. Those are state and local governments. Um, in Florida next week, our team will host an in-person, but a safe and COVID uh, socially distant leader practitioner course, influencing Florida's newest $235 million home repair program for Hurricane Michael. And in July, we'll resume our leader practitioner courses in New Orleans, and we've already seen overwhelming interest from around the country for seats in that course. Beyond the training, SBP also advises governments. We're providing training and advisory services to help accelerate West Virginia's stalled flood recovery after their flood in 2016. After meeting SBP, program officials reported that their program completed repairs for more than 200 families in six months. This was more than the previous two years of program activity combined. We're very proud of our work in West Virginia and elsewhere, but years later, Years after the disaster, the damage and the cost of delay to survivors has already been done. 
And at SPP, we know that we have to begin the work of empowering local leaders and shaping better outcomes sooner after disasters. So in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which as Thomas mentioned, was heavily impacted by Hurricane Slara and Delta last year, SBP has been supporting survivors, partner organizations, and city officials since just days after the disaster. This early assistance has helped us build significant trust with community leaders, and SBP will help the city of Lake Charles craft its vision for a successful recovery and beyond, allowing the community to rally regional and national supporters, investors, and others to their cause. Because of our early work with City Hall, SBP is better positioned to advocate for and ensure successful outcomes for survivors throughout the recovery to come. Training and advice aside, SBP is always prepared to show up, roll up our sleeves, and do the work. In Columbia, South Carolina, SBP has redesigned a failed CDBG DR housing recovery program after a for profit government services contractor failed to perform repairs for homes impacted by 2015 floods. As a direct subrecipient of the city's program, SBP will utilize the city's remaining $7 million in CDBGDR funds to oversee the repair or replacement of roughly 70 homes for families that have been waiting more than half a decade to return to safe, sanitary, and sustainable homes. We'll be excited to share more news from our advised success and intervention on future calls. We'll transition now to SBP's advocacy work. And before I give the overview here, I'd like to give folks just a second to read this quote. Disaster assistance simply is not equitable. It's exacerbating income inequalities, and these inequities are what drives SBP's advocacy work. We advocate for regulatory and industry innovation that will improve speed, predictability, and access to preparedness and recovery resources for communities and for all survivors. We simply want the system to work better for everyone. This slide is a brief overview of our four major priorities. First, SBP is working with members of Congress and a host of partner organizations to create a transferable, resilient construction tax credit that incents socially and financially aligned resilience investment in low and moderate income communities before disasters occur. When disasters do occur, we know that we can ease the burden of application for survivors by creating a single application for assistance to replace separate applications for FEMA, SBA, and HUD funded programs. Third, by requiring FEMA to adopt damage assessment technology used by the insurance industry, we can remove significant error bias, inconsistency, and delay from the assessment process while ensuring more families get more of the resources they're eligible for, like Mr. Roy, who Thomas talked about earlier. Finally, the Recovery Acceleration Fund will reshape the way disaster recovery happens for low to moderate income communities by creating a public-private partnership that benefits the most vulnerable disaster survivors, saves millions of taxpayer dollars, and prevents years of uncertainty and delay for the most vulnerable survivors. If you'd like to learn more about our advocacy work and how you can support it, please send me a note at reese, R-E-E-S-E, -E, at sbpusa.org. And I'll turn it back over now to Elizabeth Eggley. Thanks so much, Reese, and thanks um, to this amazing team. That's a lot of impact to fit into a 30-minute call. Um, this slide here is just a shout out to our amazing AmeriCorps team. This is such a can-do crew at SVP. And their commitment to serving others is once again demonstrated through the support some of them gave and are conti continuing to give to vaccination sites in Florida and Kentucky. Thanks to their combined efforts, approximately 60,000 people have been vaccinated and counting. Um, our members hit the ground running to help state and the state and FEMA connect with Jacksonville's most socially vulnerable communities using strategies that SBP deploys after disaster, such as finding, vetting, and collaborating with local partners. Um, we use the CDC's vulnerability index to identify some of the hardest to reach communities. And then we created an outreach plan, um, including resources to help volunteers counter misinformation and simplifying the process to sign up for a vaccine. FEMA was so impressed with this mapping system that they're continuing to implement it after SVP's deployment finished in Florida. 
Um, also, I think it's really cool that our team invented a created solution to an unexpected problem. You'll see the little logo in the upper right hand corner there. A lot of people wanted to post pictures of their vaccination cards on social, but rather than um, giving personal identification, um, our team created this logo for a selfie station where people could take pictures of themselves after being vaccinated. And so this is all happening in Kentucky as well currently, where our team is leveraging the lessons we learned in Florida and um, we, and sharing that in Kentucky. And we already have some amazing outcomes. Um, this is the fastest vaccination site in the state so far. So we're really proud of this team. And then this is the last slide, and I would love um, for y'all just to see kind of what's new and upcoming and on the horizon for SBP over the next few months. Um, as Reese touched on a moment ago, the FEMA Advisory Council found that their programs provide an additional boost to wealthy homeowners and others with less need, while lower income individuals and others sink further into poverty after disasters. In other words, the programs that are intended to help low income communities of color after disaster are failing this population. We also know that disasters increase racial disparities in home ownership. Black and Latinx homeowners have higher overall percentage of their net worth tied to their homes compared to white homeowners. So when disasters hit, the economic impacts of lost home equity are worse for them. Of course, there are many reasons why there need to be more programs like SBP's Opportunity Housing Program that increase the number of people of color who own homes. But it is also essential that we make sure that those who already are homeowners are able to restore the homes they own after disaster. If a homeowner is forced to become a person who rents because of disasters, the odds are against them for returning to home ownership. If you want to learn more about the intersection of racial inequity and disasters from a policy system wide and on the ground lens and how SBP's programs are driving change here, we hope that you'll join us for our upcoming webinar um, about this very topic. We will send an invitation soon, but um, this event will happen in May. Next, we are so excited to be ramping up our volunteer program this summer. There is a healing power that comes with service and volunteerism, and we are happy to unleash this by way of our rebuilding work. We have opportunities for volunteers to serve in five communities this year. So please be on the lookout for special communication on this. But if you wanna reach out now, please email the address you see here, volunteer at sbpusa.org. Along those lines, if you or anyone you know is interested in a career that combines social impact with tenacious pursuit of continuous improvement, please check out our careers page. We have a variety of positions available right now. Last, but definitely not least, our friends at at and are committed to helping SBP build resilience across the country. We've had the privilege of working with their amazing teams over the past year to build a disaster preparedness and recovery app. The goal is to launch this app this summer, and we can't wait to share it with you. So that about wraps up our presentation for today. Thanks to those of you who stayed a little over. We'd be happy to stick around and answer any questions you all might have now. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. The first question I have is from Brianna, and I think this would be for Thomas. Why are the New York and New Jersey construction home sites ending and when? So ending because we are confident that the, um, uh, the needs of both the New York and New Jersey communities, that the needs have been met. And that the role that our organization can play in identifying those low to moderate income homeowners that need just a little bit to finish the job, um, we've exhausted that. So we've done close to 30,000 individual outreach um, um, mailers in New York City and a similar um, campaign in New Jersey to be sure that we're in touch with anyone who might have slept, slipped through the cracks. So that's that's the first thing that we're really proud to say is that. We've identified the unmet need. We've met that unmet need, and we are confident that those groups who will remain in New York and New Jersey, our partners over at Habitat and Rebuilding Together, um, that they're going to be able to continue to serve 
um, any home repair needs that are related or not related to Superstorm Sandy uh, without SBP's presence. So that, that's the first thing is we know the need has been met. As for when, both sites have a plan to complete operations at the end of June. And so today we're continuing to work on homes in New York. We have an additional 20 units that we're going to repair for families before we sunset. And in New Jersey, it's about 15 projects. So between here and June, you can look forward to seeing those um, those completions. And then um, come June, we'll, we'll fully close our operations. Uh, we'll maintain our relationships and our contacts within New York and New Jersey. So we continue to provide um, some of the interventions that Reese has shared uh, both upstream and downstream, um, but our actual rebuilding activity that'll come to an end at the end of June. Thank you, Thomas. And I have a question. I believe this would go to Reese, and this is from Will Trumbull. How will the recent changes to the NFIP impact SBP's economic model? Hey, Will, thanks so much for the question. It's a perfect one. Um, unfortunately, FEMA is still pretty sparing with the pricing methodology details around the risk rating 2.0. And just to give folks some context, FEMA is changing the way it prices risk rather than floodplains and flood zones. They'll move to pricing risk for individual structures. And so I think Will's question is, what does that mean for SBP clients who've previously paid flood insurance premiums based on zones or location of their structure rather than its actuary risk. And I think right now the answer is we still aren't sure, um, but it's never been more important that folks have the insurance that they need. We know more and more um, disaster events and particularly floods are affecting those families who are outside the floodplain. Um, and so we're keeping a close eye on it and we'll surely have thoughts. But for now, we hope that FEMA will release additional information that we can better understand the impact the rating methodology will have in our communities. Thank you. And we'll ask to follow up, and this might be for Thomas. Have rising material costs impacted your scope of work? It has an impact uh, scope of work, but it has uh, frankly created a heavier weight on Elizabeth and our development team. And so um, we're seeing two, uh, we're not only seeing an increase in just material pricing, but then also lead time to be able to deliver um, certainly windows and lumber to sites. And so um, what we're not willing to do is kind of pass that, pass that cost on to the homeowners we're serving. So we don't want to reduce scope or do less work that a homeowner really needs um, to heal simply because costs are rising. So instead, what we're really looking towards is for Elizabeth and our development team to support um, fundraising so we can meet the demands of community and also working aggressively with our subcontractors to negotiate on pricing. And, and we're really looking towards a volume based model with with the subcontractors that we're using now, guaranteeing them um, work if they can uh, work with us on pricing. So I'm happy to say it's not affecting scope, but it is um, increasing the work that we need to do both in a fundraising and a negotiation perspective. Thank you, Thomas and Elizabeth. If people want to support our work, um, how can they do so? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, you can reach out directly to me or you can look on our website, sppusa.org. Um, our team would love to unpack and answer any more questions about any of the programs you all see here. Uh, and I'm always open to talk to anybody who's um, looking to invest in disaster recovery. Thank you so much. And unless we have any more questions, I think we will wrap up for today. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you for sticking around a little bit longer for this great Q&A session. Uh, we will share the recording of this call in the next day or so. So please review or share with anyone who will be interested. Thank you again for spending your morning or afternoon with us and enjoy the rest of your day. We really appreciate you. Thanks all.